Hey, good to see you. Welcome back for another video. Now today we are doing chapter 6 of the art of war. This chapter is titled Weak Points and Strong. Chang Yu attempts to explain the sequence of chapters as follows. Chapter 4 on tactical dispositions treated of the offensive and the defensive. Chapter 5 on energy dealt with direct and indirect methods. The good general acquaints himself first with the theory of attack and defense and then turns his attention to direct and indirect methods methods. He studies the art of varying and combining these two methods before proceeding to the subject of weak and strong points, for the use of direct or indirect methods arises out of attack and defense. And the perception of weak and strong points depends again on the above methods. Hence, the present chapter comes immediately after the chapter on energy. 1. Sun Tzu said, Whoever is first in the field and awaits the oncoming enemy will be fresh for the fight. Whoever is second in the field has to hasten to battle, will arrive exhausted. 2. Therefore, the clever combatant imposes his will on the enemy, but does not allow the enemy's will to be imposed on him. One mark of a great soldier is that he fights on his own terms, or fights not at all. 3. By holding out advantages to him, he can cause the enemy to approach of his own accord or by inflicting damage, he can make it impossible for the enemy to draw near. In the first case, he will entice him with a bait, in the second he will strike at some important point which the enemy will have to defend. 4. If the enemy is taking his ease, he can harass him. This passage may be cited as evidence against Mei Yao Chen's interpretation. If well supplied with food, he can starve him out. If quietly encamped, he can force him to move. 5. Appear at points which the enemy must hasten to defend. March swiftly to places where you are not expected. 6. An army may march great distances without distress if it marches through country where the enemy is not. Tsiao Kung sums up very well. Emerge from the void like a bolt from the blue. Strike at vulnerable points. Shun places that are defended and attack in unexpected quarters. Seven. You can be sure of succeeding in your attacks if you only attack places which are undefended. Wang Tzu explains undefended places as weak points. That is to say, where the general is lacking in capacity or the soldiers in spirit. Where the walls are not strong enough or the precautions not strict enough. Where relief comes too late or provisions are too scanty, or the defenders are variants amongst themselves. You can ensure the safety of your defense if you only hold positions that cannot be attacked, i.e. where there are none of the weak points mentioned above. There is rather a nice point involved in the interpretation of this latter clause. Tu Mu Chen Hao and Mei Yao Chen 
assume the meaning to be. In order to make your defence quite safe, you must defend even those places that are not likely to be attacked. And Chu Mu adds, how much more then those that will be attacked? Taken thus, however, the clause balances less well with the preceding, always a consideration in the highly antithetical style which is natural to the Chinese. Chang Yu, therefore, seems to come nearer the mark in saying, he who is skilled in attack flashes forth from the topmost heights of heaven, making it impossible for the enemy to guard against him. This being so, the places that I shall attack are precisely those that the enemy cannot defend. He who is skilled in defence hides in the most secret recesses of the earth, making it impossible for the enemy to estimate his whereabouts. This being so, the places that I shall hold are precisely those that the enemy cannot attack. 8. Hence that general is skilful in attack, whose opponent does not know what to defend. And he is skilful in defence, whose opponent does not know what to attack. An aphorism which puts the whole art of war in a nutshell. 9. O divine art of subtlety and secrecy, through you we learn to be invisible, through you inaudible, literally without form or sound, but it is said of course with reference to the enemy and hence we can hold the enemy's fate in our hands. Ten. You may advance and be absolutely irresistible. If you make for the enemy's weak points, you may retire and be safe from pursuit, if your movements are more rapid than those of the enemy. Eleven. If we wish to fight, the enemy can be forced to an engagement, even though he be sheltered behind a high rampart and a deep ditch. All we need do is attack some other place that he will be obliged to relieve. Chumyu says, if the enemy is the invading party, we can cut his line of communications and occupy the roads by which he will have to return. If we are the invaders, we may direct our attacks against the sovereign himself. It is clear that Sun Tzu, unlike certain generals in the late Boer War, was no believer in frontal attacks. 12. If we do not wish to fight, we can prevent the enemy from engaging us even through the lines of our encampment be merely traced out on the ground. All we need do is to throw something odd and unaccountable in his way. This extremely concise expression is intelligibly paraphrased by Chai Lin, even though we have constructed neither wall nor ditch. Li Chuan says, we puzzle him by strange and unusual dispositions, and Chu Mu finally clinches the meaning by three illustrative anecdotes. One of Chuko Liang, who when occupying Yangping and about to be attacked by Su Mei, suddenly struck his colours, stopped by the beating of the drums and flung open the city gates, showing only a few men engaged in sweeping and sprinkling the ground. This unexpected proceeding had the intended effect for Suma, suspecting an ambush, actually drew off his army and retreated. What Sun Tzu is advocating here, therefore, is nothing more or less than the timely use of bluff. 13. By discovering the enemy's dispositions and remaining invisible ourselves, we can keep our forces concentrated while the enemies must be divided. The conclusion is perhaps not very obvious, but Chang Yu 
after Mei Yao Chen rightly explains it thus. If the enemy's dispositions are visible, we can make for him in one body. Whereas our own dispositions being kept secret, the enemy will be obliged to divide his forces in order to guard against attacks from every quarter. 14. We can form a single united body while the enemy must split up into fractions, hence there will be a hole pitted against separate parts of a whole, which means that we shall be many to the enemy's few. 15. And if we are able to thus attack an inferior force with a superior one, our opponents will be in dire straits. 16. The spot where we intend to fight must not be made known, for then the enemy will have to prepare against a possible attack at several different points. Sheridan wants to explain the reason of General Grant's victories by saying that, while his opponents were kept fully employed, wondering what he was going to do, he was thinking most of what he was going to do himself, and his forces being thus distributed in many directions, the numbers we shall have to face at any given point will be proportionately few. 17. For should the enemy strengthen his van, he will weaken his rear. Should he strengthen his rear, he will weaken his van. Should he strengthen his left, he will weaken his right. Should he strengthen his right, he will weaken his left. If he sends reinforcements everywhere, he will everywhere be weak. In Frederick the Great's instructions to his generals, we read, A defensive war is apt to betray us into too frequent detachment. Those generals who have had but little experience attempt to protect every point, while those who are better acquainted with their profession, having only the capital object in view, guard against a decisive blow, and acquiesce in small misfortunes to avoid greater. 18. Numerical weakness comes from having to prepare against possible attacks, numerical strength from compelling our adversary to make these preparations against us. The highest generalship in Colonel Henderson's words is to compel the enemy to disperse his army and then to concentrate superior force against each fraction in turn. 19. Knowing the place and the time of the coming battle, we may concentrate from the greatest distances in order to fight. What Sun Tzu evidently has in mind is that nice calculation of distances and that masterly employment of strategy which enable a general to divide his army for the purpose of a long and rapid march and afterwards to effect a junction at precisely the right spot and the right hour in order to confront the enemy in overwhelming strength. Among many such successful junctions which military history records, one of the most dramatic and decisive was the appearance of Plutcher just at the critical moment on the field of Waterloo. 20. But if neither time nor place be known, then the left wing will be impotent to secure the right, and the right equally impotent to secure the left. The van be unable to relieve the rear, or the rear to support the van. How much more so if the furthest portions of the army are anything under a hundred li apart, and even the nearest are separated by several li? 
the Chinese of this last sentence is a little lacking in precision, but the mental picture we are required to draw is probably that of an army advancing towards a given rendezvous in separate columns, each of which has orders to be there on a fixed date. If the general allows the various detachments to proceed at haphazard, without precise instructions as to the time and place of the meeting, the enemy will be able to annihilate the army in detail. Chang Yu's note may be worth quoting here. If we do not know the place where our opponents meet to concentrate, or the day on which they will join battle, our unity will be forfeit through our preparations for defence, and the positions we hold will be insecure. Suddenly happening upon a powerful foe, we shall be brought to battle in a flurried condition, and no mutual support will be possible between wings, vanguard or rear, especially if there is any great distance between the foremost and the ironmost divisions of the army. 21. Though according to my estimate the soldiers of Yue exceed our own in number, that shall advantage them nothing in the matter of victory. I say then that victory can be achieved. Alas for these brave words, the long feud between the two states ended in 473 BC with the total defeat of Wu by Cao Chen and its incorporation in Yue. This was doubtless long after Sun Tzu's death. Chang Yu is the only one to point out the seeming discrepancy which he thus goes on to explain. In the chapter on tactical dispositions, it is said, One may know how to conquer without being able to do it, whereas here we have the statement that victory can be achieved. The explanation is that in the former chapter, where the offensive and defensive are under discussion, it is said that if the enemy is fully prepared, one cannot make certain of beating him. But the present passage refers particularly to the soldiers of Yue, who, according to Sun Tzu's calculations, will be kept in ignorance of the time and place of the impending struggle. That is why he says here that victory can be achieved. 22. Though the enemy be stronger in numbers, we may prevent him from fighting. Scheme so as to discover his plans and the likelihood of their success. An alternative reading offered by Chia Lin is know beforehand all plans conducive to our success and to the enemy's failure. 23. Rouse him and learn the principle of the activity or inactivity. Chang Yu tells us that by noting the joy or anger shown by the enemy on being thus disturbed, we shall be able to conclude whether his policy is to lie low or the reverse. He instances the action of Cho Ku Liang, who sent the scornful present of a woman's headdress to Su Mei, in order to goad him out of his Fabian tactics. Force him to reveal himself, so as to find out his vulnerable spots. 24. Carefully compare the opposing army with your own so that you may know where strength is superabundant and where it is deficient. 25. In making tactical 
dispositions, the highest pitch you can attain is to conceal them. The piquancy of the paradox evaporates in translation. Concealment is perhaps not so much actual invisibility as showing no sign of what you mean to do or the plans that are formed in your brain. Conceal your dispositions and you will be safe from prying of the subtlest spies, from the machinations of the wisest brains. Chimu explains, Though the enemy may have clever and capable officers, they will not be able to lay any plans against us. Twenty six victory may be produced for them out of the enemy's own tactics. That is what the multitude cannot comprehend. 27. All men can see the tactics whereby I conquer, but what none can see is the strategy out of which victory is evolved, i.e. everybody can see superficially how a battle is won. What they cannot see is the long series of plans and combinations which has preceded the battle. Twenty eight. Do not repeat the tactics which have gained you one victory but let your methods be regulated by the infinite variety of circumstances. As Wang Tsi sagely remarks, there is but one root principle underlying victory, but the tactics which lead up to it are infinite in number. With this, compare Colonel Henderson. The rules of strategy are few and simple. They may be learned in a week. They may be taught by familiar illustrations or a dozen diagrams, but such knowledge will no more teach a man to lead an army like Napoleon than the knowledge of grammar will teach him to write like Gibbon. Twenty nine. Military tactics are like unto water, for water in its natural course runs away from high places and hastens downwards. 30. So in war the way is to avoid what is strong and strike at what is weak, like water taking the line of least resistance. 30. 1. Water shapes its course according to the nature of the ground over which it flows. The soldier works out his victory in relation to the foe whom he is facing. 30. Two. Therefore, just as water retains no constant shape, so in warfare there are no constant conditions. And thirty. Three. He who can modify his tactics in relation to his opponent and thereby succeed in winning may be called a heaven born captain. And thirty four. The five elements, water, fire, wood, metal, and earth, are not always equally predominant. That is, as Wei Sei says, they predominate alternately. The four seasons make way for each other in turn, literally have no invariable seat. There are short days and long the moon has its periods of waning and waxing. The purport of this passage is simply to illustrate the want of fixity in war by the changes constantly taking place in nature. The comparison is not very happy, however, because the regularity of the phenomena which Sun Tzu mentions is by no means parallel in war. I hope that you enjoyed that chapter. We are just under halfway, I think. 
through the art of war. And I hope that you've been enjoying relaxing with me. Thank you for listening to another episode. It's been nice to see you. And I hope that you got to have a pause and a rest and a reprieve and a break and good night.